Uh, I'm David Scare. I uh, am an instructor here at Concordia Theological Seminary. And this is, we are looking at the per sign pericopes for Palm Sunday. Now, for this Sunday, we have two pericopes, uh, that is, gospel readings. One is from John 12, and the other is from Matthew 26. We'll try to look at both, and then uh, you can uh, make the choice of what you're going to do. When Mr. John Elmer, who was the technician in charge of producing these podcasts, saw the length of the gospel for Palm Sunday, um, he was not only amazed, he, re he remarked that if you read the entire gospel, you would have no need to have a sermon that day. And I would certainly agree with him on that. We don't want to keep the people there forever. Um, what is going to happen here, if, if uh, this is called the Sunday of the Passion. Uh, however, that has to be said, with, um, this does not belong to the tradition of the Lutheran Church. Uh, it doesn't belong to the tradition now of, of, the, um, of the Catholic Church. And uh, our people are going to be coming to church on Palm Sunday. Uh, I came across the uh, a bulletin done 15, 51 years ago and for my last Sundays at Trinity Lutheran Church in Rockville, Connecticut. And I looked at the attendance for Palm Sunday and compared it to Easter. Traditionally, this, uh, the attendance for Palm Sunday will be relatively good. And even though uh, we, uh, half a century later, uh, the society is more secularized, somehow Palm Sunday will be mentioned. So when people come to church, many of them are going to come because it's Palm Sunday. Uh, for them, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a preliminary Easter. That is to say, they'll be in church. If they come to church at all, it'll be on Easter and, and the entire year. Another uh, Sunday that will drag them in will be Palm Sunday. And I, I mention this for this reason. They're going to be disappointed if you don't say something about Palm Sunday. It, uh, if you don't preach about Palm Sunday, uh, it's going to be an anomaly that you give out palm branches. So you have to keep this in mind. So the one thing I would do for this particular Sunday is I would eliminate the epistle, uh, the Old Testament, the epistle, and the gradual, and anything in between that is traditionally put between those two sections of the liturgy. And I would go directly from the collect to the reading of the gospel. Now, the gospel at, at, a, at, a, at what they call the Eucharist, the, high ch uh, the divine service, what I call the Holy Communion, is in every case to be read by the pastor. So the pastor has to read this. Um, I haven't timed it, but it will take a long time. Now, the reason that, as much as I can determine, that they substituted the Passion Sunday uh, for the Palm Sunday is that uh, it, it could have come from a subliminal belief that uh, the people are not going to go to church during Holy Week. And uh, th maybe there's good, the attendance, by the way, for uh, Thursday and Friday, at least I can remember when it's a long time since I had a congregation, but we had church Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday morning and afternoon and Friday evening, the Saturday service had not yet become popularized. Uh, but there's been, a, there's been a liturgical shift. Now, when there's a liturgical shift like that, it's difficult to give, uh, to give way to the old, the old system. 
traditionally for Lutherans, Palm Sunday was Confirmation Sunday. It was the um, it, uh, it was the end of the uh, of the term in the German school system, and confirmation uh, a confirmation certificate also entitled a young person to go out and get his first employment. Now that goes back into this 18th, uh, not the 18th, but the 19th and 20th century. And so that custom was carried over. Now, if you have confirmation on this particular day, today uh, the Pumps, uh, Confirmation Sunday is frequently switched to Pentecost because it is the festival of the Holy Ghost and the child is confirmed by the Holy Ghost on that day. But if you do have the confirmation, according to the way it was traditionally done, you're going to have a huge challenge in, uh, in preaching. You're going to have a huge challenge in reading this. Well, with those remarks, uh, we'll make a few. You, the best that you can do if you're going to preach on Matthew 26 and 27 in their entirety is to give an overview. Now, uh, uh, this is in a way, well, not, it is in a way, it is a way, it is an anticipatory for Easter in which Matthew uh, 27, or 28, excuse me, 1 to 10 follows up. So there is, uh, there is a correlation there, there's a natural progression. I'm not so sure that the people are going to catch the natural progression, but we'll get, when we get to Easter, we'll do that. Um, uh, if we're going to find a, a theme uh, that we can trace through, uh, we, um, it would be the idea of the of the enemies of Jesus, uh, the uh, the antagonism towards Jesus uh, as he faces his death. Um, we have Matthew is uh, Matthew is very negative in bringing up uh, certain unsavory situations which are going to lead to his death. And so if we're going to take, if, if we're going to uh, get the uh, Palm Sunday theme in there, and by, uh, we're going to have to mention, we're going to have to take the, uh, into consideration uh, the concept of Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king. Now if you look at the, uh, the gospel, um, you'll notice that chapter 20, if you use Matthew 26, you're not going to have much attention to Palm Sunday. So we have to be caught, that, and the people will be disappointed, and it will be an anomaly if you give up palm branches, and yet you don't preach on that. And uh, that's the only Sunday in which you can use Palm Sunday hymns. And we have we have some very good Palm Sunday hymns in there, and it's going to have the, the theme is going to have to be that Jesus is proceeding to his death. Now this is made clear in chapter twenty six, um, verse two. It says that after two days comes the Pascha, and the Son of Man, that is the Passover, will be delivered over to be crucified. And um, you have the, um, he, he's going to be put to death by the decision of the high priests and the elders. In the Greek, I see no difference, but for the one word, the, the, the one word, archiheros, which is in verse 3, sometimes that's translated chief priest, sometimes high priest. I think it should be in every case translated as high priest to indicate that those who were at the lead, um, those who were the, the leaders of the Jewish religious community were the ones who were responsible for his death. Then comes the anointing of Jesus. Um, many of these stories I'll do in a, in a, a very scanty way because, uh, and I won't necessarily look at the Greek on the board because of the amount of time, but... Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the anointing of Jesus. 
Um, the woman comes up, pours oil on his head. The t- disciples are incensed, saying that it is such a waste in verse 8. And actually, the word means almost you poured that stuff down the drain. And uh, Jesus admonishes the disciples in a very unusual way. You always have the poor with you. Um, But I am not always with you. Uh, Now, if you want to base a sermon on that, I'm not so so sure that I would. But... The, the, um, the idea is, by the way, Matthew uh, puts a lot of attention on the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But here he, uh, uh, Jesus elevates himself there, by the way. Now, what is so significant about the anointing of the body of Jesus is that uh, she does it because she believes that Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. Uh, Jesus says she's doing it for her burial. But it's more than that. You don't repair something which is no longer going to be in existence. And uh, verse 13 is worth a sermon in itself. Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, it shall be spoken what this woman has done for her memory. In a mem- a, an amazing statement, because this may be the first reference in the... Um, in the in, in the new uh, in the gospels to a, to the word gospel the word is a gospel our our and that is in verse thirteen. Uh, this is going to be a challenge here. Oh yes, thirteen. Amen. Lego. Amen. I say that wherever if uh, is preached this our in all the gospel. Notice it says. This gospel, the evangelist is making a reference to what he himself has written. Um, as you, you probably know that I'm very much interested in the gospel of Matthew and see it as the first. Then comes the plot. Then comes the, uh, the, the high priests who are involved in the beginning of this chapter. Now appear again and now with Judas Iscariot. To, uh, for 30 pieces of silver. Now, this becomes important because tw- chapter 27 now is going to conclude uh, with a reference, uh, 26 rather, it's going to conclude with a reference to uh, Judas going uh, out uh, and throwing the silver. This all happens within a short period of time. He betrays Jesus for money. He can't live with his conscience. He tries to buy it off by returning the money. They don't take it, and it's used the field of blood. We also have in here now the next section, uh, the Passover, the Pascha, and the announcement of the betrayal of Judas. Now, looking at this pericope, in a way you're getting ready for um, Monday, Thursday, in which Judas uh, Iscariot is the clue, is the cue, uh, clue. It, it's a, he, he will always be attached to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. It's, that's the sign. It's also in the Gospel of John in chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. Then you have the, the institution of the Supper itself. And um, the meaning of the death of Jesus is given most in a most pronounced way in verse 28. And I think we kind of miss it, where it says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is sacrificially poured out in order that sins may be forgiven. That's in 28. Yes, and that's right there. Uh, over 28, this is the blood, my blood of the covenant, the taste the athe case, which is sacrificially poured out. Now, you know, this can be taken 
also this is material for any sermon, Monday, Thursday. The word poured out means to be sacrificially poured out before God. It's probably the clearest reference in the Gospels to the atonement of Christ in order that sins be forgiven. And now this picks up a theme which is introduced in the introduction of the Gospel. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And in verse 29 comes strangely an Easter reference. It says, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you, uh, with you anew in the kingdom of the Father. This phrase is rarely preached on. And uh, the Lord's Supper consists of two elements, bread and wine. Bread is a, a reminder of our mortal condition in this world, earth, that we have, to, we have to work in the sweat of our brow. And the vine of, was wine that makes life um, possible. It's, it's, it's the thank God, it's Friday theme. And this is a promise that Jesus is going to celebrate the Holy Communion again. And notice the word kainon in 29, new. It'll be different. In the kingdom of my Father, and it's the only phrase. Then comes the denial of Peter. Um, Robert Gundry has come out with a book put out by in Grand Rapids by Erdman's that says that, that Peter was as much of a scoundrel as Judas was. Well, Judas, even though it's common to say that Judas betrayed Jesus, the word betrayed is the wrong word. He denied that he knew him. Um, is this going to be an opportunity? There's a whole sermon right here uh, to say, I. I have known Lutheran clergy persons to offer prayers at civil events in which they don't mention the name of Jesus because the confession of faith is this. The first part is the Jesus. That's the nominative. That's the, that's the subject. That he is the Christ. That's the confession. Peter made the confession that Jesus is the Christ. With the denial of Peter, he even denies that he knows Jesus. So that's the thing. Then comes the concept of, the, of Gethsemane, which uh, indicates the horrors that Jesus is experiencing as he anticipates his own death by crucifixion. It says in verse 43 that he found, uh, he found the disciples, they were sleeping if you look at the word in 43, verse 43, we're still in chapter 26. If you look at the word 43, if you count in one, two, three, four, five, six words, kath audukath, which is generally translated sleeping, it's not so, yes, they were sleeping, but that's not it. It carries the idea that they had drunk too much wine. Now, that must have been a very tense situation. Um, uh, the Passover is the feast of liberation for the Jews, and that's the way it was celebrated. It was comparable to their 4th of July. They were free from slavery. And yet behind all that uh, party, uh, that celebration, uh, comes the awareness that this is not going to end up very nicely. And the word kathudantas indicates that they may have drunk slightly uh, too much. Then comes the arrest of Jesus. Um, boy, I think the point has to be made that, uh, at least it's important for me, is the death and de uh, resurrection of Jesus happens as under, it's, it happens under civil authority. He is not... Um, he is he is not murdered. Uh, we know who the, we know who did it. It's a it's a public execution, and it's it's recorded. 
And um, the theme here, which um, I think resonates, uh, do things have to happen the way they do? Uh, I think all of us do this, and uh, that we, we second guess ourselves and we second guess other people. And uh, is, it any, is it possible that the events of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday could be reversed? And the answer is no. In verse 54, it says, uh, therefore it is necessary that the scriptures to be fulfilled that these things would be so. In Jesus before the council, we have the next uh, confession that Jesus is the Son of God. Now this was, this is, a, uh, this is an amazing episode for this reason, and that Jesus is the true high priest. That's the author of the uh, book of Hebrews. That's, that's, what, that's his theme, that Jesus is both the high priest and the sacrifice. The high priest sacrifices himself. And that the high priest of, uh, was adorned in the most elegant clothing to give the impression that he was a divine person. He has gold on his garments. And so you have one uh, Jesus standing there as the prisoner before the, uh, before the, um, the Jewish high priests. And here we have the second confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter made it in 16, chapter 16. I put you in verse 63, ex or kidzo. Verse 16, excuse me, 63. Yes, or kidzo, right there. I demand that I take, I take an oath from you. Now, I guess everybody knows this, that when you're called to give a uh, to give a, a call to court and to give a testimony, and they put you under oath, you have no choice, by the way. You, he, he, he is put on the under oath. Uh, when the um, Amish say that they don't take any oaths, because it's against the Bible. Well, what's against the Bible is saying an oath about what you are going to do tomorrow. This has to do an oath with the truth. With the deposition, you have to answer the questions. And uh, this time, the confession is in the mouth of the high priest, Caiaphas. I put you under the oath of the living God. If you, and that's in verse 63, if you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you want to compare uh, the Son of God, you want to compare that with the uh, confession of Peter, it matches up. Uh, the word uh, living is not there, uh, but it is in the question according to the living God. And Jesus answers, you will see the Son of Man on the right of power coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, th this is a reference to the crucifixion rather than to the coming of of uh, Jesus on the last day. Then comes the account of Peter. Now, we've already handled that. And um, the point has to be made that a confession consists of something which is tangible to us and something which is an untangible. Jesus is what is tangible to us. Uh, he uh, he can be known, we can come to some historical, he's, uh, that there is a Jesus, we don't know by, we, may, we just don't know by faith. We know because he is a figure who really lived in our time. And so what we know about Jesus, or what we know about Caesar, uh, belongs to ordinary human knowledge, that he is the Christ, is the living God. Now, in the previous section there, we're moving along pretty fast, uh, the high priest, um, poses to Jesus whether he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus agrees to that, that he really is. And then comes the promise that they will, uh, Jesus is going to come, come, for, come for judgment. And that is a theme that has, Peter does, Peter does 
not even acknowledge the existence of Jesus. A great sermon because there are some people which uh, in, in our own lives, when a person quits the church, the last time person he merely wants to see is the, is the, is the pastor. You have the, um, Jesus is brought before Pilate, and uh, then you have the death of Judas. I haven't heard too many sermons on the death of Judas. That's verses 3 in chapter 27, uh, 3 to 10. But this happens to be an atonement passage. Um, uh, the, the people are going to ask, why do we even mention such, a, such, a, uh, such scoundrels as Pontius Pilate or, or Judas? Judas plays a part here of a person who is trying to atone for his sins. He has been, he is aware of what he has done and he regrets it and he's going to make amends. He makes amends by returning the silver by which he was paid. And uh, they, they, they keep it, by the way. The priests keep it, and they're going to put it to a charitable cause. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, then he goes out and he hangs himself. And the tragedy of it is that there's another person who is being hung not too far away who really pays for sins, and uh, Judas uh, does not. Um, Jesus is then questioned by Pontius Pilate uh, who does uh, not find he can't find any reason here's another this has to indicate the fickleness of humanity in this situation um, of course it's true isn't it that uh, for our political advancement we, um, we, we would rather give up what we know to be true because then the Matthew's very, very clever here because Jew, uh, Pilate is the one who puts Jesus to death, but it is at, because, but it, but it's at the instigation of the crowds because he wants to. And um, there's an amazing um, scene uh, passage in here. Um, yes, and that is in verse 19. We could take a look at that. At 19. Oh, yes. As he was sitting on the bema, bematas. Do you see the word bematas there? As he was sitting on the bematas. If you have traveled um, in, uh, in that part of the world where the Romans ruled and they set up their cities, there was a public podium. There was a podium in the center of the city in which the uh, judicial or the governmental authorities would ju adjudicate matters. And that was called the Bema. I, su well, I suppose that we, we would say behind the bench. And he gets news from his wife that she's had a dream and having nothing to do with this just man. Another sermon all in itself. Like the wise men, she gets a dream. Like the wise men, she's not a Jew, but a Gentile. And she recognizes who Jesus is. It shouldn't be translated, have nothing to do with this innocent man, have nothing to do with this just one, and then... then over against this Gentile woman who understands who Jesus is, is the crowds who cry for Barabbas. And then the Jews take upon themselves the guilt of the death of Jesus. Now, it, it's, maybe it's ironic uh, that this, this thief is called Barabbas. Um, but you can't preach on all of this on a Sunday morning. The people won't like you at all. Uh, but it's ironic that Barabbas means the son of the father. So you have the person who is really the son of God being uh, paired up with a rabble rouser who is the son of the father, and they take him. And this, then comes the crowning of Jesus. 
um, this is up. Uh, they crown him with thorns and they hail him as in verse 29, Kyre Basilau Ton Yudayon, Hail King of the Jews. Now this picks up a theme that it, that is introduced already in the genealogy because the genealogy is the um, a genealogy of the kings from David down to the Babylonian captivities, uh, the progenitors of kings and the descendants of kings and Jesus who is a king themselves. Hosanna to the son of David. That's the, that's a, the, if you're preaching on this for Palm Sunday, and, I, and what, what, if you're going to read something like this, at least from my point of view, I don't think I, I, I would manage to keep the sermon no more than 10 minutes. You have to figure this one out. You simply cannot do everything which supposedly is required of us on this day. If, if you're going to have a good crowd. Then Jesus comes to Golgotha. And um, just to set the record straight, Golgotha, also known as Calvary, is not a hill. So they might do something to your favorite hymn on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Or it might, it might diffuse the belief. You got the mountain of transfiguration. You got the mount of the Sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. You got Mount Calvary, names of many Lutheran churches, and the mount in which Jesus gives the commission to the disciples. No, Golgotha is a garbage dump. They did not, putting somebody to death by crucifixion uh, was not intended uh, to be a was not intended to be aesthetically beautiful, like we have pictures of the of the cross coming out of the pine forest. That's all very nice, but just simply is not true. Now you have a whole theology in the crucifixion scene, and I myself am getting frustrated by this thing. They. Um, the resurrection theme is picked up in verse 40. He who destroys, the one who destroys the temple and in three days will build it like a demon, let him save himself. Now this is going to be very significant because they understand, you know, we have to get over the concept that the, a, a passage has only one meaning. Because in one case, they understand it, that Je Jesus is put to death for insurrection. If you have, uh, in certain cases, the national park, military property, it maybe it belongs to all the people, but you dare not go on it, and you dare not destroy it, because that'll be a federal, that'll be a federal crime. Jesus is, is uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem uh, belongs to the Roman government, not to the Jews, and he said he was. Of course, he wasn't talking about that. He was speaking about. He was speaking in metaphors. And then you have the death of Jesus. And this happens, we begin in verse 5. Uh, this is, in Matthew, the death of Jesus is an apocalyptic event. It begins at noon, that is the sixth hour. And Jesus is, has been deprived of the presence of the Father. Uh, notice that in verse 46, it says, He cries with a, cries with a loud voice, Anaboezen, um, Jesus phone megale. Uh, indicating now he is taking over control. The, uh, he cries, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, which thou hast forsaken me, indicating that he is now in the depths of hell. And the Jews are so perverse, they don't even recognize their own scriptures. Um, so they're, the previous to this, uh, they knew the words of the scriptures, but they didn't know the meaning. Here they don't even recognize the words, let alone the meaning. Verse 50, Jesus cries again. The word palin is in there with a loud voice. And this is the true Pentecost because he releases the Holy Ghost. And uh, this m marks the end of the, uh, of the, temp of the Jew Jewish religious worship. The curtain separating the Holy of Holies has now been split. There's an earthquake. Uh, the dead are being raised. The day of judgment has come. And the centurion makes the confession that truly, and you will notice that the word alethos comes first, truly this was the Son of God. Uh, the translation that truly he was a Son of God does not 
is not correct at all. Then we come to the burial of Jesus in verses 51 through uh, 57 through 61. This is important. Not only important, but without a true burial, there is not a resurrection. Paul includes the, res uh, the burial of Jesus as part of the original proclam uh, proclamation. I delivered to you of first importance that Christ died according to the scriptures and that he was buried. And the burial of Jesus is preliminary to the resurrection um, when the next Sunday will also be from Matthew chapter 28. Um, now, uh, when Jesus was uh, hanging on the cross, they claimed that um, he had intended to destroy this temple. You who destroyed the temple, save yourself. Now, all of a sudden, they know exactly what he was saying. That was a metaphor. He was speaking about his own body, which is the temple. Take a look at the end of verse 63. After three days, I will, I will be raised. And now they are going to make sure that it doesn't happen. And uh, the first proclamation of the resurrection comes in verse 64. Um, seal the tomb till the third day. Not so not coming, the disciples, and they steal him. And here is uh, the, the message of the Christian church, Eregethe, Apa, Ton, Nikron. He has been raised from the dead, and a guard is sent at the tomb. And so we will be prepared now with the conclusion of Matthew 26 and 27 for the Easter gospel, which is Matthew 28. And we'll do that the next time. Thank you.